Okay, welcome back again, or welcome um, at the conference, Future of Code Politics 2, uh, Technologies of Radical Care. Welcome uh, for, yeah, to our last panel of today's conference. Um, before we begin, I call a few logistic things. We very kindly ask you to wear your masks if possible during the sessions. And we are at the entrance. Uh, there are also medical masks for those who, don't, who do not have any with them. So, and we have translation into German spoken language um, here on site at Camp Nagel. If you want to give it a try, um, just pick up your headphone at the entrance. Um, und nochmal auf Deutsch. Uh, wir haben hier eine Übersetzung in die deutsche Lautsprache hier auf Camp Nagel. Falls ihr die mal ausprobieren möchtet, gibt es Headphones am Eingang. Es ist der blaue Kanal. It's the blue channel for the translation into the German spoken language. Unfortunately, uh, there is no translation into German spoken language in the stream. Leider gibt es im Stream keine Übersetzung in die deutsche Lautsprache, aber Untertitel. There are subtitles. So for our viewers in the stream, again, um, if you need subtitles in English or German, Afan Oromo or Lugana, please check the video descriptions on the bottom of the YouTube stream. There you will also find a link to the subtitle function. Don't be worried if they don't pop uh, directly, pop up directly. Uh, it takes about 20 seconds until the subtitle function is on. The subtitles in Miche will be unfortunately added uh, a bit later. They will be available from August 29 at the latest. So back to our panel. Uh, I'd like to go back to the beginning uh, of the day for a moment. Um, we started with a conversation between Mia Mingus and Lilith Wittmann in which Mia Mingus explained her notion of access intimacy, which asks also about non-logistical uh, or, or non-logistic conditions of actual access for everyone to care. And this, of course, includes the question which experiences, which knowledge, uh, which you know, very material realities are centered when relationships and also structures of relationships or government uh, software or whatever of care are established, what are technologies of knowledge accumulation, of archiving and knowledge selection, where does epistemic violence take place and how can it be count uh, countered? Uh, so that we can truly take care for each other. And now we basically come full circle with this panel, who's following, uh, following um, which is following documenting care, archiving, disability pasts and futures. And now I'm going to turn over to Grayson Brillmeyer. Firstly, there, over there on the left side. Hi, <laughs> Grayson, and hi, everyone. I will first start with Grayson, and I'm sure that Grayson will then introduce the moderator and the panelists and so on. But I um, firstly want to introduce Grayson again, uh, who curated this panel. And Grayson works as a researcher at the intersection of feminist disability studies and archival studies. They are the founder of... One second, this is very uh, complicated with my cards. <clears throat> They're the founder of the Disability Archives Lab and among other things is currently working on the Crip Futures Archive, a collaborative digital platform for disabled people to archive themselves. And now, Grayson, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us for this panel, uh, Documenting Care, Archiving, Disability, Past and Futures. Um, I believe that Penteha Abareshi will be unable to join for this panel, but I do sincerely want to thank them for helping shape this panel for what it is today. And I also want to thank Alice Wong for the, the formation of this panel as well. 
Um, given that Penteja is unable to join, uh, Liu and I have decided that I might speak a little bit more than I was planning to originally, um, but we will mostly focus um, on the other panelists and the work that they are creating. Um, I want to start this panel on disability by acknowledging the relationship between ableism and colonialism as it shapes our relationship to the different lands that we are on. Um, colonialism has and continues to bring disease, debility, disability, trauma, and death to Indigenous peoples. And I also want to acknowledge how um, ableism has and continues to justify the colonization, enslavement, and institutionalization of many people, how ableism shapes who gets deemed as less intelligent, as not civilized, and as in need of rehabilitation, and therefore institutionalized, dispossessed, and displaced. Um, so I start with this because I want to acknowledge the caretakers of the land that I am zooming in to this panel um, on past, present, and emerging. I am located on the traditional territory of the Ganyangayaka, a place that has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst nations. And I want to recognize and respect the Ganyangayaka as the traditional custodians of these lands and waters and acknowledge the violence of the colonial project, which is ongoing in this place. I also want to um, deeply thank the organizers and the captioners and the translators and everyone whose labor went into making today possible as well as more accessible. Um, so sin sincere thank you to everyone involved. So to get started, um, as an archivist, it is an honor to introduce this panel that is so close to my heart. Uh, for disabled people, the concept of care is very complicated, and I think this echoes with lots of the things being said throughout this event. Um, some of us know CARE's violence through medical, curative, rehabilitative violence that gets excused or masked or cloaked as a form of care um, that can deny us agency and can deny our humanity. And alternatively, the radical care that disabled people show each other is something entirely magical, um, as Mia Mingus, Alice Wong, and Sandy Ho tell us that access is love, and all of the care and community um, that disabled people have with one another can be deep, magical, community-based forms of love where we co-create spaces that center disabled people's needs and desires. So this panel addresses the ways that disabled people document this multifaceted care, how care can be understood and how care might be remembered in its different forms. Um, I use the term archiving as flexibly as I use the term care, um, and it's a very wide variety of uses to really draw on the ways that disabled people document um, for different publics, for themselves, for others, for community, or choose not to document at all. And I really start this conversation thinking about the many ways that disabled people want to be remembered or not remembered in the future through all the complexities of what we might consider care. Um, so I would like to start by introducing our mo moderator, Liu Meiju Chen. Liu is a queer, trans, non-binary, disabled abolitionist nerd descended from the islands of Taiwan and Ireland. They are currently the oral history archive manager at the National Public Housing Museum in Chicago. And they view storytelling and oral history as key strategize, strategies for thawing trauma, empowering connection, and creating radical change. Their personal work focuses on anti-imperialism, queer and trans liberation, and the heterogeneity of Asian and Asian American identities, Black Asian coalition movements, and the textures of silence and absence. 
So Leo will be moderating this panel as well as introducing the other panelists. So I will turn it over to them. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, Grayson, for all of that. Um, really appreciate it. Um, I'm calling in, like Grayson said, from Chicago, and I just wanted to drop in the chat um, nativeland.ca. This is a, a community-based uh, movement or resource, I guess, uh, from the Native community um, to help folks who are not Native learn more about what land they're currently occupying. They've covered North America, South America, Australia, and they are starting to do like Africa and, and Europe too. So it's uh, it's exciting actually. I just kind of looked over the entire map and they've expanded it since um, I first started using that uh, in facilitation two years ago. So um, I'm excited to introduce our two panelists today. Um, I have known one of these people from social media and the way that they document care and illness um, using you know, Twitter and Instagram. And so it's it's an honor to be in their presence. So that's uh, Walela Nahanda. Walela uses they, them pronouns and is a black, non-binary, disabled, demisexual, queer, cultural worker and cancer and stem cell transplant survivor. Over the years, Walela has been featured in several publications such as the Out 100 list of 2020 for their organizing related to Black patient advocacy, Teen Vogue, The Guardian, Nylon, Vice ID, Self Magazine, and Self Magazine. Walela has given numerous workshops at colleges across the country on the Black radical tradition, medical apartheid, and how to make organizing more inclusive of disabled people. As of 2022, Walela is a Zoe Glossia Fellow and is represented by Folio Literary Ju uh, Junior and Wilhelmina's Models Social Media Division, Willie Social. Through Walela's time organizing, they have learned their poetry must act in service to the movement as a means to shift consciousness and communicate nuance in an accessible manner. Our second panelist today is Jane Shi, who uses she, her pronouns. Jane is a queer Chinese settler living on the unceded traditional and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. She is a poet, writer, editor, and organizer whose work appears in the Disability Visibility blog. Briar Patch Magazine, Brunt Gallery, CV2 Magazine, and is forthcoming in Queer Little Nightmares, an anthology of monstrous fiction and poetry by Arsenal Polk Press, among others. She organizes Masks for East Van, a neighborhood fund that distributes N95 masks and educational materials, and is the author of the chapbook, Leaving Change on Read by Rahilo's Ghost Press. She wants to live in a world where love is not a limited resource, land is not mined, hearts are not filched, and bodies are not violated. So um, thank you so much to both of you for being here today. Um, and I wanna just open the panel. We're gonna jump right into the questions. Or wait, no, we're not jumping into the questions. We're going to have each panelist talk about themselves for um, a couple minutes. You can talk about it, you know, five minutes, but also because um, it's only two of you, if you go a little over that, that's also all right. Um, so, uh, Walela, I'll turn it over to you first. Thank you so much for that. I was. Um so shocked when it was my name that followed when you said that um, preamble. I was like, who is it? And I was like, oh my goodness. Um, so I'm just so happy to be here. Um, I absolutely, I, I just the, I just have been looking forward to this like all month um, just because it's such a necessary um, topic. And so it just means a lot to me uh, that I was even considered for this and for, I just appreciate everyone's work involved and everyone who's here attending and helping. And so, yeah, my name is Walela. I'm born and raised in Los Angeles, California, which is also known as Tongva territory. And really my means of starting to document care was an accident. It wasn't on purpose. It was a means of survival. I got diagnosed with advanced stage 
leukemia in 2017 and I, I was 23 then so I'm young and I was looking around for other black cancer patients just anywhere just YouTube is back to the age of the YouTuber being massive um, I was looking on Instagram I was looking on Twitter I was looking everywhere and I could not find even in fictional things like a John Green novel, The Fault in Our Stars, or A Walk to Remember, and all these, like, frankly, I don't know if I can cuss, but, like, just crap cancer movies that are just alive from hell. And so it was, it's hard when you don't see yourself, you're like, well, am I supposed to survive? And so I came across Claire Wineland's work, and I saw that Claire Wineland, she was young, she's white, had cystic fibrosis, and completely someone you didn't, wouldn't think I could relate to, but she really talked about the shame that shrouds disability and illness. And I had, you know, so I always am, I, no one is above, you know, critique, and so I had some critiques, but at the end of the day, Claire made me really look at okay, if I don't have this for myself, then I just need to start talking. And I just wanted to find people online who were also like, yeah, what you're going through is not some random thing like that you're making up in your head because we get gaslit so much by the medical system, especially as Black people, especially in the so-called U.S. And so basically like in not in documenting my survival, which a lot of it had to do with needing money and frankly, when you need money on the internet and you're black and people perceive you always as like a swindler and um, cheating the system and whatnot, you do have to really put yourself out there in this like autobiographical fashion. And so a lot of people just happened to grow up with me, with my cancer. My following kind of grew a long time where I started realizing, oh, wait, my doctor ignoring me? That's medical neglect. Oh, wait, this happening in this hospital? That's racism. Oh, wait, there's a book called Medical Apartheid by Harriet Washington. Like, And being able to find those words I wanted to be able to convey that to my own community no matter what education level no matter what class status but very much for me for working class colonized peoples and so from then I started taking my social media as a way of teaching but also a way of archiving because when you think about social media and you think about documenting in the quote-unquote U.S. It's very much for white people. Like white people, settlers particularly, they can, you, they can trace their ancestry so far back. There's portraits, there's pictures. I go on ancestry.com and I look at a death certificate and I can find out another ancestor. And I'm like, oh, wow, like this is what I have. And that it's strange to feel like that's the most uh, closest thing to an archive as opposed to like an actual picture. And so I started noticing um, just even the access to a camera for Black people, for us to take a picture of ourselves was not a thing. And so social media, while it was not designed with the mind of Black people archiving ourselves, um, it was made from um, Mark Zuckerberg making Who's Hot or Not, basically, at wherever Ivy League college he was at. They unknowingly, it became a place for Black people of all types, but specifically Black disabled people to show, hey, this is what we're going through. It, sh it shined a light in a way that was on our terms. And naturally, anything that we try to do when you're not white on the internet on our terms does is met with a lot of skepticism and questioning, unfortunately. And so um, I think just the, in the invention of social media and the way that we can document ourselves and create time capsules is a way that's been unprecedented. And I have started to see the value of that as I've gotten older, obviously now I'm 28. So I'm like, oh, wow, there's a lot that we can do here. And a lot of stories that live on even when people pass. And I, as I was losing people around me who were black, you go back to their social media and you see what they had to say about being black and disabled. Or when, you know, some of them didn't share that publicly. Um, and that, that was a lot too, you know, that, that right there is a testimony. Everything is a testimony. And so, um, Deciding to go through with my stem cell transplant, I had to advocate extremely heavy. And so I just wanted to show people this process when I was looking for how does this work? How does like my specific process with cancer and even getting diagnosed with other disabilities, how, how, would, how, how, can, how can I show that in a way that's actually helpful um, and honest? I don't want to sugarcoat anything. And so everyone went through the whole process of seeing the lack of Black donors in the stem cell registry and I was fully prepared to wait three to five years for a donor because there's a 23 percent chance for black people to find a match and so people helped me not only raise money for myself for years but also look for a donor and so the care that I wasn't receiving 
in person, I was getting online and I was getting on social media. And so it, it is a double edged sword when you have to put yourself out there so much that you feel like nothing is yours and your journey isn't yours. But at the same time, other people can feel like their journey is theirs and they can have some level of self-actualization. And so basically from that point forward, I have notes, that's why I'm looking down because I can't remember anything. Um, so just there's that. Um, but I also realized how important it was to not just share a story, share an analysis and share a specifically an anti-colonial, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist analysis and realize that even for me, like we have such a US centric, uh, even in radical spaces of how we look and as opposed to looking globally. And for me, that'd be looking at the global diaspora, but also the global South and just how much um, disability becomes a means of silencing people and sort of leading folks out to a pasture into a slaughterhouse. And so I would always say, and I always, and I felt like it was so important for a lot of black people for us to say this was, if I die, no, it wasn't me. No, it was my insurance. No, it was this. If I'm in this hospital and this is happening on Twitter, know that like, and you know, turn up for me basically. And that's a sad reality, but that's something that when I go and look at my ancestry, I don't get to see that story. And I hope that, and you know, I don't know if I'm gonna have children or not or anything like that, but hopefully future generations and even current ones can go point somewhere and say, oh, wait, you need a black cancer patient, can't disabled person go to Walela, but eventually, and we are seeing it a lot more, way more black disabled people are, are put to the forefront, which has just been so, again, double-edged sword, but it's really nice to see. And so um, basically during the pandemic, I saw um, a hoarding of supplies that immune suppressed people need and I'm immune suppressed. And so I started freaking out some and because I, it was completely just, um, it, was a, it was a wasteland at Target and CVS. I mean, I don't know what everyone has everywhere where they are, but um, I wound up accidentally creating a Google doc. I just went on Twitter and was like, Hey, anybody who's immune suppressed, can you please drop a, you know, where you are and what you need. And if you're in this area, can you drop this off? And then it just, um, it, it took a life of its own, which is, you know, always the fun thing about the internet and um, turned into a Google doc where there, we had multiple people organizing throughout the country to get over 200 people, not just immune suppression related supplies, such as like Lysol spray, hand sanitizer, hand wipes, masks, but also food, getting them connected to organizations in their community so that they can have a hotel to stay up in and things like that, because the pandemic really just and continues to ravish our communities. And so it was very clear that the government was not going to handle it properly early on. I was like, well, if disabled people are already treated like this before pandemic, then during it, I can only imagine. And so I just was trying to do what I could for my little corner because I couldn't go outside. And so um, being a Black stem cell transplant patient where basically you don't have an immune system and there's a pandemic where you need it, where you kind of need an immune system, I really saw this massive failure from the government, um, but also a massive failure, frankly, in organizing as well and on a larger scale. There was a lot of great collective work. There was a lot of work that went unknown and unseen, and that's usually the work of the people is usually goes unknown and unseen in the work of the opportunists and to be very much at the forefront. And so um, I saw it as something bigger, even beyond um, Black disabled people, but Black elders, Black houseless people. And like we used to say, you know, you're Black elder and disabled, Black and disabled and houseless, Black trans folks, um, the ways in which that they were deciding basically who was going to live or die in an ER. And like, we already experienced that going in. We go into the belly of the beast when we open the emergency door rooms. It's try to get out alive and so to have that during a pandemic is terrifying and so it's really important for me to share just my feelings i think black people are beyond analysis i think black people are expected to perform we're not seen as human um, and i think that's why there's not really an archive of personal stories only certain stories that are very inspirational that are meant to feel good that are not really meant to like for us to consider the material realities of that we were kidnapped here like, i did not show up here willingly like i'm like why am i here so like that for me it's important for us to even like connect all of that and so now i'm putting i'm realizing how much written word is a living memory in itself and um, 
social media, for instance, is a living, archiving is a living memory in itself. And so what made me realize that was Zora Neale Hurston's Bear Coon, where Cujo is talking about, he's the first person that we hear from where he can talk about being stolen from Africa and brought here. And all these black people in the US are like, oh my God, we have no one in our family who can say this. And so that led me to actually start digging through archives. And I found a couple of my family members being able to speak on what they went through, which is such a unique thing. And so for me, um, I'm currently working on a manuscript that is due in three days. Um, so I'm, that's why I'm looking a little busted right now. <laughs> I'm in my pajamas, I will be honest. Um, but I realized just how important it is to not only share my story, but to link it to the past. And that's really what the Black radical tradition is about. That's what the Black arts movement was about, where we have Audre Lorde, Alice Walker, Octavia Butler. I mean, these are descendants of them. We have Gwendolyn Brooks, I, uh, Mary Barak. I could go for days, so <laughs> let me just stop. But really, what I also look forward to after turning this manuscript in is that um, that book to be in conversation with books like A Burst of Light by Audre Lorde and the Cancer Journals, um, but also to be able to intentionally archive the stories of Black people as a whole and Black disabled people in a time in which we are dying in mass and it's an urgent need. And so that is essentially what I do in a nutshell. I hope I did not talk for too long. I'm so sorry if I did, I got excited. Um, so I look forward to everyone else. So. It's all good. This time is uh, you know, here for us to be learning about each other and from each other. So thank you for sharing all of that. Um, and We'll we'll come back to some of what you said in the discussion. Um, Jane, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and your work? Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you, Alayla, for sharing all of that. Um, so many resonances and tensions and connections. Um, so just a little bit about me. I um, am usually on the uh, occupied territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. Um, today, I'm in Chicago. Um, and I also grew up in Richmond, British Columbia, which is Musqueam, Sawasan, Stolo, Katsi people. Um, and I think that one of the casual ways that I introduce Richmond to people is that it's one of the most, it, it's one of the the most Chinese like uh, cities in North America, which is a very um, interesting way to grow up when you like move from uh your birth country um so in in richmond british columbia there was a sort of like um me being introduced to what a different kind of uh disability like care formation was as opposed to the one that i grew up in um so in richmond during um the early tw uh, 2000s uh which was under the christy Premier Christy Clark um, was premier. Um, de uh, developmentally and intellectually disabled kids had teacher assistance, and there was more of a sort of middle class um, official care center for disabled folks. And it was a very like, hmm, I had never seen uh, these people before because in Shanghai and Nanjing where I grew up um everyone was like in separate schools so I considered myself like to be normal but the thing is I didn't if I looked a little bit closer at how I thought about myself um in my early years that wasn't really the case it was just me sort of like responding to the expectations around me of course I was in the normal school so I'm normal but um in um at the age of five I was like I'm not beautiful and I was already sort of reading myself as queer in that because I was saying um beautiful pe only beautiful people got married and had kids which is a very like eugenicist idea but it was also me like very like subtly claiming a role for myself those are the people who would do these things and I don't have to um so yeah there was like a, a very early like self-understanding of like being disabled um 
that wasn't really safe to fully claim because the people like seeing how you know there's a segregation and then dejection and paternalism that people experience it was too dangerous for me to claim um and i guess i returned to these formative memories because they really represent a moment in time where um cis hetero patriarchal like reproductive control and a country's reputation really depended on the healthy urban only child um especially like in their integration into capital um so i yeah i'm autistic but didn't have any way of knowing it um and um so who gets seen as disabled and worthy of care in hospitals in schools um it's it's a, it's a game of resources right so it's very politicized um and so on the other hand as we've already talked about it's like who so how disabled people care for one another within the margins is often erased and minimized so for example um i wrote about this in an article uh called the revolution will be translated um um the care that indigenous peoples offer in um, Chinese migrants throughout the 1800s and into the present is rarely written into the stories of disability. So um, Chinese migrants were worked in the mines and um, they got sick and uh, sort of like the more communal practices that pe indigenous people had were not, you know, um, the the paternalistic abandonment of the white settlers. Um, there was a care offered and that's rarely acknowledged. Um, the care that a disabled poet offers a piece of writing allows her, allows them, allows him to write themselves into existence. Um, but that is rarely seen as documentation. Um, academia is a very, very ableist space. Um, you imagine like the history academic historian going into the university archive as documentation but as Willela said social media um pinterest the instagram accounts um private notes app um live journal blogs zanga if people remember that <laughs> um toilet paper um napkin graffiti uh detention prison poetry there's um there was like the detention um of Chinese migrants way back in the day and they would like write poetry on the walls and that um that has been written about in a book um yeah and then the other thing is we rush to celebrate each other but don't like sometimes ignore the grief that we experience um I think that a lot of poets these days are writing about grief for obvious reasons but I think that grief is also a form of documentation and it's it's sort of like it's like a form of documentation that sees ourselves as fully human as grievable and it's also a form of care um and I've been thinking about how to um remember and honor the people who have passed as if they are still here and as if they're still listening to us, like how do we treat them with honor um, and grace as well? Um, yeah, so I guess in my poetry and writing, I wanna remember that I was, am, am cared for and that people like me will be cared for in the future in ways that we most desire and not just in sort of cookie cutter um, textbook ways. Um, I want to conjure that future in that in my writing as well. Um, and I think that in order for that work to be sustainable, we have to acknowledge what being uncared for or cared for in violent ways does to our psyche and our being and our bodies. It's it's a hard it's a multiple therapy session. Um, uh, if therapy was affordable. Um, um, yeah, and yeah, I think a lot about the lens of like hard work and subservience um that's passed on through generations not only passed on like because like I could talk for hours about like filial piety but there's also obviously like the very specific labor relations that Walela talked about um and also 
like in a global context where you know for example like sugar white sugar planters in louisiana or railway builders in bc um you know negate black folks and allow asians to be used for white supremacy's continuation that's a huge source of like like violence these days especially you know um i guess it's a little bit louder in the states but it's also in canada where like hate crime is used in really anti-black pro-police ways um but yeah um historically like for example in new orleans um newspaper um the scholar moon ho jun um documents that chinese coolies were considered superior to their black counterparts and i really really pause over these specific words that the they used um so chinese coolies were seen as young athletic intelligent sober and cleanly um i think about that a lot because i'm like these are things like i've never been to louisiana um I've never heard about this until more recently, and yet, like, these concepts, young, athletic, intelligent, sober, cleanly, have such a huge, like, impact on how I can, like, see who I can be in the world. Um, yeah, it's just, a, it's like a reminder that um, anti-Black, anti-Asian, uh, ableist notions of bodily worth are rooted in maintaining global capital, empire, and settler colonialism and obstructs and erases the collective interdependent care that we are seeing today um, that we sort of deserve to offer one another. And we see these ideas in things like the poisoning crisis, which is especially bad in Vancouver, but um, it's bad everywhere. Um, in Canada's medical assistance and dying policies, which has recently expanded to, you know, include more people <laughs> um, in police violence in hospital care rationing so um yeah i think i think that like the the thing that is worth documenting not only the you know violent white like um structures that impose these narratives but also like how people care for one another within these contact zones of exploited labor um yeah um yeah and i guess like just just i don't know taking care of one another is a really hard thing when um Celine Chuan writes about this idea of scarcity breeds contempt so i think that understanding and giving grace to ourselves that we can't always care for one another in the ways that we want but we should still try um and um yeah i guess one thing that has been a source of like you know remembering to not give up which is very hard these days but it's like found family and found family is a really hard thing when you haven't been taught how to choose like chosen fam how do you how do you like like choose your family if you haven't been taught how to choose but like um despite that um yeah i feel like having found queer disabled family has um really helped me learn how to care for myself and believe for myself believe in myself a little bit better um like it's i don't know it's really hard when like some of the traditional forms of like family are so can be so rigid and it's hard to untangle the like like what is white supremacy what is like north america what is like what is chinese and like that is obviously a very like um what do you call it contentious thing these days given how the chinese empire also um causes harm in the world too so yeah i don't know just honoring um moments of grief is how i've been documenting care i'll say more later <laughs> thank you thank you both i i have so many notes <laughs> and i want this panel to be much longer i feel like the three of us could have like so many different types of panels and i'm like i need to actually focus on the theme of this one but i have a lot of other <laughs> thoughts um 
So we've been kind of um, touching on this question, but I want to ask, ask it specifically because um, as Grayson said, I, uh, my background um, most recently is, is in oral history. And one of my favorite types of oral history questions is, is kind of just asking people to define how they see different terms because words mean different things to all of us. So um, I wonder if each of you could um, talk for a couple of minutes about how you define care. Um, and Walela, I'll start with you. Hi. Um... Care is really hard to define. I think um, the whole quote of just like, it's hard to choose when you're not taught how, like what's already been said. So when we grow up in these really violent structures where we are indoctrinated into not caring about each other and into um, the nuclear family. Oh, my dog is trying, sorry. My dog is right underneath me. <laughs> She's trying to ruin the whole panel right now. Computer's about to flip. Um, so, um, I think about care, it was really hard for me to figure out what that even looked like because I didn't receive care in the way that I needed as a child. So like when I'm a child and then I'm 23 and like newly disabled, I'm just like, and also not knowing I was disabled when I was younger too. That's a whole other thing. So, you know, you feel like what you need, you're going to be punished for. And so care for me is just no fear of punishment for what, like, I have enough, a lot of care is rooted in safety, ultimately, for me. And safety, obviously, again, it's it, it's a very hard thing to define in a world that is very hell-bent on making you not feel safe. Settler colonialism and the ways in which that Black people specifically are targeted to essentially just be eradicated or just moved around or just seen as just labor horses, it's really hard to even say, am I worthy of care? So that took a really long time. Even during my cancer battle, it took me a couple of years. And so how I define care, at the end of the day, I think about it's rooted in love. And like what was said at the beginning of the panel, the access is love, right? Care for me is that everyone has the opportunity to participate. Everyone has the opportunity to try to have their material needs met or talked about, um, or at least addressed, acknowledged, seen, which is something with the pandemic, I think is like very much butting heads at the moment where disabled people are saying how we need care. And then there's other groups of people, including organizational groups that are like, mm, too bad. And so it makes me question what is liberation for? So care for me is a liberation that includes everyone. And I think disability is often the final pillar of understanding that people love to look over because it's always everyone thinks they're invincible until they get. Um, I, I think of Susan Sontag talking about the kingdom of the well and the kingdom of the ill. And eventually someone is always going to have a passport to that other side. And I grew up around elders and I grew up in black community. Your grandparents are everything. And I think that is um, something many of us can relate to. And so I was very close with my grandparents and my grandparents died early. And so I was part of taking care of my grandma. I was part of taking care of my granny as they were passing. And so grief work was always something that was just naturally integrated into my life as a black person, as a black child. I remember, I think probably the first time I was able to define care was at my grandma's funeral because my mom could not go on the stage to speak because she was so distraught. And I was 13. And I was like, well, I'm not going to let my grandma go out without someone. No one's not going to say something like someone has to say something. So I just went up there and just like, I don't know what I said. All I remember is I wanted the room to feel that this is a home going. And I really appreciate when we talk about when people are gone they're still here. And I think for disabled people, it's really important for us to have that. I get really emotional talking about that because when I went through my cancer battle, I was did not, I, I, the care is violence, very much experienced that. And I very much experienced a lot of domestic violence and abuse and didn't know it. And who was there and who did I go to constantly? My ancestral altar. And so thinking of the ways in which grandparents have cared for us, things that our families have done for us. And so the ways in which my family made me feel protected from my own family and so how could I bring that into organizing how can I bring that into these spaces so care for me is being able to feel love express love feel safe enough to do that and really just ask someone how can I support you now 
a care is not something that necessarily I feel the need to impose on someone. Um, I, it's more, I want it on their terms. I think care has a lot to do with agency as well. Um, so that's like my very <laughs> rambly, rambly way of saying it. <laughs> so, I really love that question though. Um, and I hope I answered it, but yeah, I'm looking forward to the other answers too. You definitely did. Um, Jane, you want to share your thoughts? Yeah, it just strikes me that like when we enter spaces that we're supposed to be cared for, we don't get asked that question. Um, yeah, so I think that like, um, consensual, informed consensual care is so difficult to come by and it really, really shouldn't be. Um, I think that, like, I think about how like in British Columbia, there is a childcare crisis and the childcare crisis is also related to like how uh, Canada does immigration so like care workers are often migrant workers um, who are underpaid and um, it, I'm reminded of how I did child care one time and uh, you know one of the parents one of the white women parents called me by another name <laughs> it was just like uh, Okay. Um, yeah, very, very underpaid. But but I think like how there's there's so many like familiar familial structures of care that don't really exist without exploitation, which is and violence and abuse, which is which is really heartbreaking. Um in Chinese the word care means Guan Xing, which is like the word guan is means close. And it's like, what does it mean to be, to have boundaries around the care that you offer? Um, I think about that. Um, I think about um, how I, yeah, like in high school, there was a lot of domestic, uh, there was a lot of intimate partner violence, but no, um, there wasn't any like resources really or if there were resources there weren't they weren't um accessible so being like the unpopular kid <laughs> who didn't have a lot of friends uh people were just immediately turned to me because there was a lack of conflict of interest and like that was how I learned how to like care for do this kind of support work and it's so strange to think back about it on it because I'm like I shouldn't have had to learn how to do these things um but and yet i think that instinctually like when we are marginalized we 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 want to respond to um we want to like offer the care to to others that we weren't receiving ourselves and i think about that a lot because like i've been just kind of unraveling like my p personal impulse to like care for others um at the expense of myself and i i think that yeah like equitable care is so hard to come by because as walayla was saying like how do you feel that you're worthy of care um yeah i don't know like i think that like it learning how how um learning about how like specific social services and um official like like you know medical systems how those things work and how like they actually prevent people from offering the care that others deserve it's like it it's like how do like it, it, it makes it seem it, it feels like our organizing needs to be about like literally unraveling and like dismantling the parts of the system that are like preventing us from caring for each other like how do we care for each other when we're in a cramped classroom with like one lecture and whereas in like a lot of other kinds of community spaces um that for example indigenous elders and leaders lead it's people are in a circle um people can see each other um uh, people start with a dance or a song and that offers a lot more of a like we see each other like as equals kind of as opposed to you know just I don't know things like that 
is how, what I think about. Thank you both um, for sharing that. I'm really struck by what Bolela said about kind of aging and our relationship to elders being one of our very first sort of interactions often for most people with health and therefore also disability and care and grief. Um, and I'm also noticing, I mean, I haven't really talked about my background, but resonance is with my own stories and thoughts about this, about how all three of us um, are talking about race and how care is impacted by race and how that can, like race can show up in our lives in a really intimate way. I mean, I'm biracial. And so, you know, even what kind of care do I get from different sides of my family? What kind of violence do I experience from different sides of the family um, is, is um, present in my mind. I'm, I'm thinking about this um, scholar named David Ang, who wrote a book called The Feeling of Kinship, Queer Liberalism and the Racialization of Intimacy. Um, and he talks about um, a lot of really brilliant things, you know, adoption systems and the racialization there and, and lots of other, you know, goodies that we won't get into um, right now. Um, and I am keeping an eye on the clock and we only have 10 more minutes. So like I said, the, the panel needs to be much longer. Um, I think I'm just going to jump to our last question because of the time. Um, and and Walela kind of uh, hinted at this a little bit in one of their previous answers. Um, how do you want to be remembered in the future? And Walela, we can start with you. Oh man, uh, when you have an advanced stage illness and you have, uh, I used to call cancers basically as an assassin that's living inside you, and I've changed. You have to change your relationship to death, and you change your relationship to disability. Even I, eventually, was just like it just is, and I just, um, I, how I want to be remembered is just a witnessing. I think a lot of black people, it's like, oh, this person was this, 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 and this category and this category. And then they did all this work and that's what makes them valuable. And I just want to be remembered as a person who told my story honestly, and that tried my hardest uh, and tried my hardest to challenge the ways in which uh, we view things like death, the way that we view things like grief and disability and acceptance of disability especially within the black community like it's just so dis disability is almost like a slur in our community because it means you can't work and if you can't work here uh, we've known since we were brought here if you can't work you die and so and that still happens to this day and so if anything um want to be remembered as i just get emotional because i like i don't have cancer anymore so i'm like dang like this is just breaking up so much but um want to be a person who cared about my community who tried who just tried in my own way. And even if it wasn't to the uh, productivity standard that is ass assigned onto all of us, that um, I did it in my own way. And that hopefully whatever I leave behind can live a lot longer than me. And I think that's ultimately what my ancestors did with even our names and changing our names and taking over our names and passing down names. My middle name is the furthest ancestor I can trace is her. Mary. So like the ways that we keep those things. And so I just want um, the way that I feel that Cujo is a collective ancestor for uh, us with Zora Neale Hurston, I can only hope. And I say that with like the utmost, just like, just no, oh, please, maybe that um, a, a decent number of kids can pick up this book in the future and say, dang, that's another ancestor for us. Thank you. Um, Jane, you want to go ahead? Uh, how do you want to be remembered in the future? It's it's interesting. I, I feel like the thing that I come to first is I want to be remembered as flawed and imperfect, but still loved by friends and found family. I think that like, I, yeah, I feel like embracing flawedness and imperfection is very like important to me because I find that like I find very suffocated by remembering people as like you know like myth mythologizing people I find that really like 
difficult because I'm like, what are my, like, I don't want to be mythologized. I don't want to be put on a pedestal when I remembered. I don't want to be <laughs> put on a pedestal now either. So it's like, yeah, just, I want to be remembered as a, a bunch of people love me and they care for me. And I tried, <laughs> like, I don't know. I think it's, uh, yeah, I struggle with the idea of being remembered because like, if I, like if I have boundaries with people in my life now, like I should, I deserve boundaries when I'm gone too. Like, I don't want to be remembered by everyone. Um, I don't want my memory to be exploited. So yeah, that's what I think about. Thank you for that. I, I feel like the idea of embracing perfection is like so fundamentally aligned with kind of disability justice and and disability praxis, right? Because it's all about resisting the idea that there even is a perfect out there, that there is any sort of universal or normalized perfect out there. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yes, there is no normal exploitation in, in death. Um, is very real um and and the the idea of how do we remember people right like just kind of bringing it all back together to the theme of the panel here which is archiving disability pasts and futures documentation like all, all of these are oh good <laughs> good kernels um well thank you so much everyone for um being here today with us. Grayson, is there any last words that you want to share, uh, having been just, you know, listening? Um, I just, I want to thank, yeah, Walela, Jane, and Leo for their vulnerability and for this amazing conversation that I am excited to continue. And I think there's something for me really interesting happening too of these paralleling concepts of how disabled people experience care and then also how care is thought of in arc in an archival context too like how ca archival care can be violent and it can be about ownership and denying agency instead of as you all are saying meeting people where they're at respecting boundaries and vulnerability and the complexity of of people so i just want to thank you all so much and thank the again all of the people providing access to this panel um and thank the audience for listening it really has been an honor to to witness this really beautiful conversation Thank you. Yeah, thank you to all the Camp Nagel folks, all the, you know, and access is not just like about disability and ability, but it's also about language and language justice. And I really appreciate the, the dedication from the organizers to, you know, provide language access for all of us folks. Um, so I just want to mention uh, quickly that a link that I dropped in the chat earlier didn't show up in like the live stream. So that will be included in um, the, it will be linked underneath the YouTube stream and on the website after the panel, um, we can also include links to uh, Walela's work. Jane, do you, do you have like a social media? Okay, well, we'll, we'll include everyone's links so that you can continue to follow the work as we said, you know, throughout the panel. Uh, the the kind of, even though it's a, a double-edged sword, social media and these virtual ways of connecting, they really are so important to the disability community. That's like, honestly, the reason I joined Twitter was for disability Twitter, like, and gotta just like drown out the rest of the chaos on there. <laughs> um, so yes, thank you everyone for coming and uh, that's our time. Thank you. I don't know if you can hear me now over there. Thank you so much for this inspiring conversation for this wonderful end of our, yeah, today's conference day. Uh, it was a day full of wisdom, radical thinking, questioning, imagining, uh, thoughts on radical care and also vulnerability. So it was a really, really great conversation to end. The day. Um, yeah, now I'm really looking forward to tomorrow, the last day of the conference. We start again at 11 a.m. with 
a conversation titled Against Capitalism, Technologies of Radical Care. And the writer, activist and scientist Jasnaya Elena Aguilar-Gil will invite us to broaden our understanding of technology and talk about ways of thinking technologies beyond capitalism in conversation with the initiator and curator of this festival, uh, Lorena Yaume Palasi. And I highly rec recommend you to join us tomorrow again. And yeah, I look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow. Thank you very much. Goodbye.